I tried Dr. Andrew Huberman's morning routine for one week and yet I failed, yeah. but Here's what I learned. So for those who don't know, Dr. Huberman is a widely respected neuroscientist and professor at Stanford University. He has an awesome, awesome podcast called Huberman Lab, which I've been consuming for the last, let's say year, year and a half. And I've actually implemented a lot of his best practices from sleep into my own morning routine over the last year or year and a half. But I figured, what if I dial it up a notch and follow it as closely as possible for one week? First, waking up. Now I set my wake up time to be the same as Dr. Huberman's, which is around 6 a.m. Plus or minus 20 minutes. Sometimes I woke up before my alarm. Sometimes I slept in a little bit, but I was generally 5.45 to 6.15 on just about every day. Now within the first hour, he talks about the importance of getting early morning sun exposure. That does a lot to actually set your circadian rhythm, not only for your energy and wakefulness during the day, but for the release of melatonin that night to help you fall asleep. Early in the day, two to 10 minutes outside without sunglasses is going to be really beneficial for a huge range of biological functions and brain state. Now as someone who has struggled with sleep onset insomnia many, many times, I find this to be mission, mission critical because otherwise 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, I'm tossing and turning if I don't get my early morning sun exposure. So after using the bathroom and brushing teeth and putting on clothes and all that stuff, I would get out within about 30 to 40 minutes and get my sun exposure. At this time, just like Dr. Huberman, I will hydrate. And the first couple days I was actually doing a water only fast, which you can watch up here for three days, I had nothing but just water. And it's kind of nasty. So after a couple days of salt water, I just went back to regular still water, which I prefer. Normally I'd be doing green tea right now, some oolong, but we want to avoid any caffeine, even a little bit of caffeine that is in tea in the first 90 minutes. So we're doing water instead. Dr. Huberman talks about the benefits of hydration with the electrolytes but I'm not sure how significant those are. I just resorted to regular tap water. I'm not sure if there's some greater benefits that I'm missing because I'm having still tap water rather than salt water or water with uh, electrolytes, but I'm sure one of you guys will let me know with a comment below. Next up is what he calls predictable, tractable practices. So essentially small things that reinforce to yourself that you are the one in control of your brain, right? You're not at the mercy of your emotions or your state of motivation. So common thing would be making your bed. Make your bed. So I made my bed. Oh yeah? Now he also talks about no email or social media in the morning, which I completely agree with and I've been doing for a long time. I do use my phone, right? I do generally play podcasts, but I specifically make it a point to not open my email and to not open any social media apps. But now at this time, he takes care of something important, one really difficult task early in the morning. So some examples from Dr. Huberman would include reading a research article from start to finish, working on writing a document for a grant or research paper, planning and researching a podcast, etc. So he generally does these things for about an hour roughly. But I couldn't actually stick with this and I'll tell you why in a second. But after, he'll now have caffeine and his drink of choice is yerba mate. And the reason he suggests waiting 90 to 120 minutes to have your caffeine is because of adenosine. So real quick about adenosine, caffeine actually works by competitive inhibition. It actually blocks adenosine from binding to the receptors in the brain and that's how it modulates your wakefulness. So I talk about caffeine a lot more in detail here, but long story short, it builds, adenosine builds over the course of the day and that contributes to you feeling tired and drowsy and overnight it resets. However, there's still part of that resetting process early in the morning in the first 90 to 120 minutes, which is why he suggests you wait to have caffeine because if you have caffeine earlier, then you're messing with that whole adenosine resetting process. Now I've tried yerba mate, but I just, I love the flavor of good quality oolong tea just too much. So I've actually been drinking this, which is the 2021 Mei Zan Wui Oolong from, I totally butchered that pronunciation. Bruh. This is from Tea and Whisk, which is where I get all my tea. You can use coupon code Kevin Jubal for 15% off at checkout. And then after his caffeine is when he's gonna get his workout in it. He alternates between weight training and forms of cardio. And he also does no phone during the workouts. So by this time, which is now 10.30 to 11, this is when he has his first meal, his post-workout meal. He says he usually has oatmeal, fruit, fish oil, and a protein drink. And then 90 to 120 minutes after that is when he has his first real lunch, which is the biggest meal of the day. He'll have steak, salad, carbs, etc. After that, he works for 30 to 60 minutes and then has a short yoga nidra session or a nap. I tried sticking to it, I couldn't. There's actually a few points where my morning routine differs and I just couldn't, even though I tried to do it for a couple days, it just felt 
off. So here's where my morning routine deviated and why I couldn't stick to it for a full week. So the first part is doing that hard, challenging work after waking up for about one hour before having caffeine and the workout. So that one hour session is too short for me to actually get into a deeper focus state. And I either wanna keep working and then push off my workout, or I just don't find it to be sufficient enough time to get into that deeper state. Oolong tea versus yerba mate, I already explained. The workout, I actually move up. So after getting my morning light exposure, I'll sometimes stretch in the morning, depending on how my body feels, but I'll then go work out immediately. So I'm either on the stationary bike upstairs doing some cardio, or I get my resistance training in at the gym. So there's a few ways to set and calibrate your circadian rhythm, sunlight being the most obvious one, and exercise too. So I like to start my days with a workout, and I used to experiment with doing later workouts, something like 7, 9 p.m., and then, surprise, surprise, I'd have trouble falling asleep. So the morning workout actually helps you with your sleep because it stimulates you in the morning, calibrates that circadian rhythm. And I'm also measuring my uh, lactate levels, trying to dial in that zone two. Overdid it. Part of the reason I find this so important is that it gives me a lot of positive momentum at the beginning of the day because I feel like I'm doing something that's challenging, I'm getting a, a good sweat on, and sometimes if I get too deep into work in the morning, then I keep pushing off the workout until later and later. And sometimes the quality of that workout actually suffers. Whereas early in the morning, I have a lot of energy. I can spend adequate time without having to really rush things. And then I also don't run the risk, which has sometimes happened, where I work out at 6, 7, 8 p.m. And then I can't sleep at night because my body is so stimulated with all the orexin and the other hormones that I can't wind down and fall asleep at a reasonable hour. He also does no phone during his workouts. I cannot do that. I can't even do it a single day because Two reasons. Number one, I listen to podcasts when I'm working out and I need my phone for that with my AirPods. And number two is that I track, if I'm doing weight training at least, I'll track every set, weight, and rep count on my phone on Google Sheets. Now, similar to Dr. Huberman, after the workout, I will do the protein drink with the fruit, with the fish oil, and um, I will generally actually make a, a big smoothie, but sometimes I will just do you know, the protein with the uh, almond milk with fruit on the side. I don't do oatmeal, I really don't like oatmeal. The fruit is really important, the carbs are really important because you wanna spike insulin, it's anabolic, so that when you have that protein, you get more of the benefits, more of the uptake. And then again, similar to Dr. Huberman, I'll have a larger meal about two hours after that post-workout meal. But for me, it's now shifted because I started my morning with the workout, so I'm having my protein shake around 8.30, maybe nine, and I'm having my first larger meal around 11 o'clock. Dr. Huberman does also do time-restricted feeding, also referred to as intermittent fasting sometimes, which is somewhat of a misnomer, and he eats again later in the day, starting around 11. These days, I'm not doing that. For me to actually stick to something like 16-8, if I'm eating at eight or nine in the morning, I'd have to stop eating around four or five in the afternoon, and I wanna be social in the evenings, etc. And another reason why I'm not restricting the time window during which I eat these days is because I'm on that bulk season. Hey, everybody. <laughs> The final thing is the yoga nidra or the nap. And as Dr. Huberman says, for some people this works, for some people it does not. For me, it does not work because I need that sleep debt at night. If I don't have that sleep debt because I took a nap, then it's gonna be a lot harder for me to fall asleep. Once I'm asleep, I'm good. But that sleep onset insomnia is something that I do struggle with. So that's what I learned trying his routine for one week. Now I failed, right? Because I wanted to follow his routine as closely as possible for a week but I just couldn't. Now the important thing here, and Dr. Huberman actually says this as well, he doesn't say his morning routine is the best in the world and everyone should do it, right? He says there are certain foundations that you need to get dialed in, and then after that, it's gonna be based on your personal preferences. Now the two things for me have been, number one, getting that early morning sun exposure, and number two, consistent wake and sleep times. Dr. Huberman talks about both, and I think the latter, the consistency with when we fall asleep and wake up is so underrated. It really helps with your sleep quality, and it's possibly even more important than duration because we focus so much on eight hours of sleep, but if you sleep one day from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and then the next day from 4 a.m. to 12 p.m., your sleep quality is gonna be total shit. And while you want to have some best practices and those foundations in place, be flexible, be forgiving with yourself, right? Because I try to sleep every night by around 10, 10.30 and wake up around six. You know, on the weekends, there's gonna be times when I stay up later because I wanna be social, I wanna hang out with friends, and that's all right. Sometimes you don't stick to your schedule. Like today, I woke up at 4.30. I don't know why, my body just woke up at 4.30. And rather than trying to force myself to fall asleep, I just said, okay, 
time to work out. So I couldn't get my early morning sun exposure because it was of course dark at 4.30, but I got my workout in and started my day early. Now, one last thing I wanna mention that I have talked about a lot on both Med School Insiders and this channel is reducing blue light exposure at night. And Dr. Huberman talks about minimizing any fluorescent light between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. And I actually have smart lights throughout my house and they turn red every night at 9 p.m., which serves as a reminder for me to get ready for bed as well as reduce my blue light exposure. It's like a dim red. But the other thing I learned from Dr. Huberman last year was actually the positioning of the light as well. In the evening, you really want to avoid bright light of any kind. And again, it's an averaging. You can use light boxes and things of that sort, but you wanna flip on as many overhead lights as possible. Whatever lights are present in your environment, lower in your visual field. So this would be desk lamps, floor lighting. So light that comes from higher up is gonna actually hit the bottom of your retina, right? Whereas light lower on the ground, like a campfire, is gonna hit the top of your retina. So it's not just the brightness and intensity or the color of the light, but also the positioning as to where it is. So what I've done since then is actually installed a lot of night lights throughout my house so that when it is nighttime, I don't have to turn on bright lights overhead. I can actually illuminate certain darker areas in my house with just the night lights that are motion activated at a much lower level. Anyways, I'm curious what you guys have learned from Dr. Huberman that has helped you with your sleep. Let me know with a comment down below. If you haven't already, check out my 72 hour water only fast or this video about sleep. Much love my friends, and I'll see you guys in that next one.